Hi, Eric. This is uh, Eric Grotsky, who is uh, a new member of the Jewish Bund of the uh, uh, J uh, Jewish PLO, the Jewish uh, People's Liberation Army. Sorry, organization. <laughs> We're not an army. <laughs> I was thinking about the Black Liberation Army, uh, the one of whose uh, prisoners, you know, I wrote to recently, but um, I don't know if he got my letter. But uh, uh, we are the uh, uh, Jewish Bundes chapter called the uh, Jewish People's Liberation Organization, the Jewish PLO, JPLO, which is uh, a chapter of the Jewish Socialist Bund, which is to be found at our website, uh, jewish-socialist-bund.net. And today we're going to be talking about uh, Muslim-Jewish relations. And uh, I uh, wonder uh, what uh, aspects of this we can get into. There's about three different aspects that I can think of. Uh, first of all, uh, there used to be a, an accusation by the uh, Nation of Islam against the Jewish people that the Jewish people were responsible for slavery or financing slavery, something like that. Some sort of you know, vague accusation that was made by its leader. That is, of course, after Malcolm X. And I found it to be a very suspicious you know, accusation because what I had read about that period in uh, political economy was that there was a, uh, uh, a tri a tri the North Atlantic Triangle trade, which uh, was that, you know, centered in England, London, in which, uh, England uh, sent uh, goods, manufactured goods, you know, to the colonies and uh, went back to Africa. No, went to Africa, picked up the slaves there, brought them to uh, North America and then brought goods back from North America to England. This was a trilateral chain uh, trade, you know, that had, uh, you know, emerged, you know, in the British, you know, um, imperial political economy. Okay, so uh, the banks in London, of course, were British banks, and they financed the slave trade. So I couldn't figure out, you know, like, how come, you know, like, all of a sudden Jews are involved in the slave trade, you know, when it was, you know, a British thing, you know, a British imperial, you know, scheme, you know, like it was their strategic, you know, political economy of, of how they were making money. So, <clears throat> Uh, checked into it, and there were a number of studies that were made. And it turns out that, you know, in the uh, southern plantations, there was, you know, perhaps 2% of the uh, southern plantations were owned by Jewish people. Or was it in the Caribbean that it was 2%, you know, one or the other. But anyway, it was very low. And in the Caribbean, even though there was uh, only 2% of the plantations uh, that, you know, had slave labor on them, were owned by Jewish people from Britain, most likely. <laughs> Nonetheless, you know, black Caribbeans themselves had 17%, you know, plantations under their control. So with blacks, you know, who had black slaves as well, you know, so the, you know, the amount of Jewish participation in slavery, you know, was rather minimal, most minimal, in fact, and could no way, you know, mm -hmm. be used to accuse, you know, Jewish people of, you know, operating the slave trade. And uh, furthermore, you know, then the secondary, you know, accusation of Jewish bankers financing the slave trade, that was as well, you know, discounted, you know, when you actually looked at, you know, the sources of financing, it was found to be the uh, London banks, you know, the, which were uh, uh, not uh, involved in the slave trade. You know, I figured that was the case, you know, from the beginning, you know, because the slave trade was very lucrative. So, you know, why would, you know, the, uh, the national bourgeoisie of England allow such a lucrative trade, you know, to be, made, you know, held in the hands of, you know, Jewish uh, entrepreneurs? No. Or financiers? No. No way. They would take it over themselves, you know, because they were the ones, you know, who were trying to make the money. And of course, you know, they paid, you know, 50% of the revenue went to the queen. <laughs> and this was the imperial, you know, uh, way in which things operated. So all these, you know, traders, import exports, uh, and bourgeois, uh, developing bourgeoisie there, they had to pay 50% of their profits, you know, to the, 
to the monarchy. So, you know, surely, you know, they weren't going to let that, you know, fall into the hands, you know, of any uh, Jewish uh, businessmen. No, this was, you know, British, British enterprise. So, so that was taken care of until there was a British Jewish black activist by the name of Jackie Walker, who came out, you know, with this accusation, you know, saying that his Jews, you know, were responsible for slavery and she is a Jewish people, Jewish person was speaking up, you know, on behalf of the black people because she was a black a national herself. Okay. So I proved, you know, to her that it was wrong. And she admitted as such, you know, in a, in a, a video uh, meeting that she had, you know, with other people like Terry Kali, et cetera, who were sort of, you know, coming to back her up. But she admitted that she had made a mistake and, you know, she was forgiven. Then the other aspect uh, that is problematic, you know, between uh, uh, Muslims and Jewish people was the uh, Khyber uh, massacre in history, when initially uh, the Jewish people of uh, Medina didn't want to convert to being Muslim, you know, because they figured they were already Jewish and that was good enough. And uh, there was a, a massacre of the Palestinians that took place in Khyber for some reason, or there was a battle. And uh, this has turned into a slogan, call, slogan at some demonstrations called uh, Khyber, Khyber, uh, Ya Yahud. Uh, and uh, this was, you know, a uh, genocidal threat basically against Jewish people, but it's not used anymore. And then Hamas changed its charter, which uh, the initial charter of which in 1988, you know, blamed uh, Jewish people for Zionism and, uh, you know, said that this was caused by the international Jewish conspiracy, you know, as proven by the protocols of the elders of Zion. So, you know, they realized after a while that this was just a Zionist uh, police uh, fabrication you know, to turn people against the Jewish people and uh, not against the Tsar. So Hamas, you know, smartened up and they dropped that and they wrote another charter in 2014, I think it is, came out with that mm -hmm. and said that the problem is the Zionist uh, movement and the Zionist, Zionist ideology and not uh, the Jewish people. And then they even came out, you know, with op-eds in the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, uh, saying that uh, they would recognize the state of Israel if the state of Israel recognized the state of Palestine. So they were in favor of mutual recognition. So everything changed, you know, with Hamas, even though people still kept on perpetuating the stereotype of Hamas being genocidal, Jew-hating, you know, organization affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, which they actually had quit. So, okay, that takes care of a second, you know, um, misinformation about Jewish people that is uh, part of the uh, popular or populist, you know, political culture of the Muslim Ummah. So this is something that I think that we have to uh, be able to correct as uh, a Jewish person. And, and in your case, you know, you have uh, more credibility, even, you know, as a, a Muslim Jewish person. So that was the second thing that was problematic that I knew about, that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, mm -hmm. Then, uh, the third problematic was that, you know, this Nazi movement initially uh, presented itself as an anti-Zionist movement, saying that the Zionists were, you know, uh, an example of Jewish imperialism and Jewish imperialism was trying to take over the world. And the Nazis were trying to save everybody, you know, from the Jewish conspiracy, that type of, you know, nonsense. So uh, they carry this, you know, into the uh, Arab countries the Nazis, they sent ambassadors who were just propagandists and they would, you know, carry this line, you know, to try to make uh, Germany popular amongst the um, Arab countries and to get them to side with uh, Germany in each of the wars, you know, First World War and Second World War. So the Ottoman Empire was part of that, you know, Axis uh, powers, you know, because uh, they thought that they were going to uh, make gains out of this or at least save their empire by getting Germany to back them up, you know, because they were threatened by both British and French imperialism, which was coming, you know, to carve them up. So they mm -hmm. thought, you know, that Germany was going to save them. <laughs> well, this is the same line, you know, that Japan, you know, you know, made in the Second World War, you know, when they were talking about China, because they were invading and occupying China. <clears throat> and uh, it turned into a big bloody massacre of 20 million Chinese people, 20 million. You know, about the same as, you know, the number of Russians who were massacred by the Nazis. Okay. 
And the Japanese, you know, justified it by saying that they were coming to save China from Western imperialism. <laughs> okay, sure, there was Western imperialism, British imperialism that had occupied China for a long time. And Japan, you know, like it was just using it as a pretext to come and occupy China itself and expel the British, claiming that they were being anti-imperialist while being imperialists themselves. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the Nazis did the same. They came in, you know, to the Arab countries and said they were trying to save them from Jewish imperialism and uh, who were allied with the British and the French. Okay, so this, you know, lasted for a long time, you know, because even after, you know, the Nazis were defeated, you know, Germany did not recall those Nazi ambassadors. <laughs> they used them. And also, the, a lot of the Nazis were used by both Western Germany and, uh, and the United States to fight against um, East Germany and uh, Communist Russia. So they became allies of the Nazis <laughs> instead of, you know, wow. you know, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Okay, so the Nazis, they were arguing this, you know, and they got, you know, like uh, uh, the Mein Kampf, you know, book from Hitler, uh, translated into Arabic, you know, and, and circulating it there. When I was in Palestine, I saw the Mein Kampf in Arabic of Hitler being sold in the streets of Ramallah and in the market at Nablus. And I spoke to the guys and I said, you know, like, you know, this is nonsense. You know, it doesn't mean anything for you. It's, it's not true. And they wouldn't believe me. And they kept on, you know, selling it. You know, I would have bought it and destroyed it, you know, but the guy, he wanted like uh, equivalent of like $80, you know, for the book. Is incredible. So this is a big, wow. problem, big problem, you know, and particularly a big problem in uh, in Palestine. Although it's getting better, I'll tell you, because in the schools yeah. run by the United Nations, the students are taught that not all Jews are Zionists and not all Zionists are Jews, even though they still keep on using, you know, the the diminutive, you know, of Jew, you know, instead of Jewish. But you know, I can report that it is getting better in Palestine, and certainly there's a big change in Hamas. So, you know, those are the things that I wanted to make you aware of and uh, uh, ask you now, you know, like how, you know, we can cope with these problems and, uh, and how we can uh, build up an alliance between the, the Muslims and the Jewish people so that we can make some breakthroughs in the impasse of Palestine and in international relations as well. Do you think that uh, it will be possible to uh, for us to be able to do so. Yeah, I do, and the, it'll take a while because the in the United States we have uh, Democrats returning more Palestinian supporters than then like the Republicans, obviously. But I met I actually met a Republican that actually was a pro, she's Muslim, she's a pro-Palestinian supporter. So it's it's really weird, you know. Hmm. And, um, and I just think that we, we can achieve we can achieve it eventually it'll take time though yeah uh i remember um you know uh the uh congresswoman uh what's her name aoc uh oh uh, yeah 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 so um she was talking about you know palestine defending herself because the zionists were attacking her of course and she happened to mention that she comes from a sephardic family herself that escaped to south america and then eventually converted to being Catholic or whatever. But, you know, she, she indicated, you know, that she has, you know, she understands, you know, what it is to be Jewish, you know, because she comes from a, a Sephardic family herself. So very interesting, you know, this is never mentioned again. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, she broke through, you know, uh, with that comment and uh, made a, a lot of headway. And I, I didn't see, you know, the accusations of anti-Semitism directed against her uh, again, or to the extent that they were before. So I think that she, um, you know, uh, dealt with the, um, the Zionist propaganda in an effective manner. I think you can as well, because of your position. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what side of my family is of Sephardi or I think they're Ashkenazi, but I'm not sure how we're saying because I never really looked into it, you know? Yeah. But, um, as a Jewish Muslim, I definitely support the Palestinian cause. I think that we can get past the the stereotypes and the stigmas, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of arguments that are used, you know, to support Palestinians, but they're wrong. 
And uh, when uh, people use wrong arguments to support Palestinians, it discredits, you know, the Palestinian cause. For instance, right. you know, like uh, there's a couple of ex-Israelis that are promoting this uh, idea as well. Uh, one of them is uh, Shlomo Sand, you know, who's a Francophone living in France, you know, become a Frenchman, saying that he's no longer Jewish, <laughs> and blaming uh, Jewish people, basically, you know, for, for what Zionism has done to the Palestinians. Then there's this other guy, Gilad Altsman, who uh, even works with, you know, fascists to uh, you know, present some sort of, you know, Jewish conspiracy to take over the world, you know, as a Zionist lobby. And uh, he as well, you know, like uh, discredits, you know, the Palestinian cause, even though he gets a lot of attention because he's, you know, simple to understand sort of. Uh, now, the idea that... Uh, uh, Jewish people are trying to take over the world is uh, the one problem there, which is easily uh, discounted, you know, because if Jewish people are so strong, how come we got, you know, wiped out, you know, in the Second World War by the Nazis? You know? So that's easily sort of, you know, disproven. But these two ex-Israelis are promoting the idea that the Jewish people are not Jewish. <laughs> in order to discredit Zionism, because Zionism says, you know, that Jewish people are Jewish people who came, you know, originally from the 11th, you know, from uh, Canaan, from uh, the uh, Eretz Yisrael, as it existed at one time for a brief period in history. Okay, so they say, you know, well, the Jewish people in Europe, you know, like, they're not Jewish, you know, because they came from Khazaria. How do they get this idea that Jewish people came from Khazaria? Well, a lot of, you know, like Muslims believe this, you know, because they cannot, you know, accept Zionism. Zionism is saying that they came, you know, from that land originally. Therefore, and they know Zionists are lying. So they're saying that they're lying about that as well. But it's not so simple. So, mm. for instance, you know, I'm an Ashkenaz. Okay, my parents come from Poland. I speak Yiddish. Yiddish is my first language, not English. And... Uh, Yiddish is, uh, you know, a derivative of Mittelhochdeutsch from the Rhine Valley. And so I speak a form of Germanic, you know, uh, dialect, which has become a language of its own, its own manner of pronunciation, etc. But I can go to Germany and speak German with my Yiddish, and it's understood. So in the where else, you know, did the Jewish people come from, if not from Central Europe? Because the language, uh, you know, proves it. You know, to say that Jewish people come from, the Jewish Ashkenazim come from uh, Khazaria and not from the Levant, and that they were just converge, converted people, you know, who had no ties, you know, to, to that land in the first place, is wrong. I mean, it's appealing, you know, to uh, Muslims uh, who want to destroy Zionism, okay. But it doesn't work because it's not true. You know, and uh, speaking Yiddish, you know, is the proof that, you know, my family's uh, history does not come from Khazaria. I do not speak Khazarian. It has no similarity to Yiddish. It's similar to German. And we come from Central Europe. And we went to uh, Poland, you know, when the king invited us there because he wanted, you know, workers. And there was, you know, a massive unemployment for Jewish people in Germany because the Jewish Christians would not give employment to Jewish workers. So, but... Ashkenazim are not, you know, the same as Palestinians, you know, we look different even, you know, why? Because the original 350 Jewish traders and uh, slaves who were brought to Rome couldn't get married with Jewish women because they were in Canaan and they were in Rome. So what happened is that they uh, uh, met, uh, you know, women, European women who converted to being Jewish got married and they had children. And that's how the Ashkenazim, you know, were made. A nation of 11 million out of, uh, you know, 350 original, you know, Jewish men and, uh, you know, the, you know, 350 you know, European women. So our maternal DNA is European. And some, you know, uh, Muslim critics, you know, say this, oh, this proves that the Jews don't come, you know, from there. And so the Zionists are all wrong. But if the Zionists, you know, want to discount such an argument, they could do so easily because the paternal DNA of the Ashkenazim is Semitic and the same as Palestinians, basically. We have, a, you know, some of the same, you know, genetic halo groups in the paternal DNA. 
Paternal DNA comes from uh, the uh, microcognitum, and paternal uh, DNA comes from the nucleus. So they're different sites, you know, different studies have been done, and they seem to be conflicting, but actually they just complement each other. So, you know, European Jews, Ashkenazim, like me, okay, do have ties, you know, to the Orient. But that doesn't mean, you know, that we're Zionists or that we should be Zionists. It just means that we live together with the other nations there and uh, we should continue to do so if we want to live there and not try to expel the other nations. And that's the trouble of Zionism, you know, because it picked up the European notion of a nation state from Hegel and said, well, if the others can do it, you know, we can do it too, you know, and they say it's justified, you know, because it's, uh, that's the way things are done. And so they went in there with British support and uh, try to get rid of the Palestinians. They couldn't be Nazis, you know, because, you know, the Jewish opposition wouldn't have allowed that. So they had to, you know, resort to expelling the Palestinians. They'd go into each village, one after the other, massacre 75 Palestinians. The rest would run away. If they didn't, they were killed. And if they tried to come yeah. back, they were killed. So in the 47, 48 war, there was like 15,000 uh, Palestinians killed. The rest fled away. Those who tried to came back, uh, about 5,000 were killed in that way. They were called infiltrators. And that was <laughs> justification enough for the Zionists to just kill them. So well, that's how Israel was established, you know, and that's why Israel should be opposed and not because, you know, we're Jewish. Jews, you know, and most of them lived together there quite peacefully, you know, for, for all the uh, centuries previous to that time, to the time mm -hmm. of the Zionists. Did you know, though, that there was a, some massacres of the Jewish people by Muslims? Very infrequently, and not at all like what the Christians did to the you know, Ashkenazim. But uh, there were a couple of times that there were massacres. Yeah. And that should be discussed. Oh, wow. Muslims nowadays, you know, discount that. They say that it, that should not uh, have happened and it should not be endorsed. It should not be promoted and should be opposed so that it doesn't happen again. But uh, this is part of the history of of Jewish Muslim relations as well. Yeah. There was uh, some incidents in which uh, attacks were made by, you know, false flag attacks, you know, made by Zionists against the Jewish synagogue or whatever in Iraq. And they tried to blame it on the Muslims because there was a history of such attacks. So they tried to use that history as a credible way to discredit the Muslims and try to convince, you know, the Iraqi Jewish people who come to uh, Palestine. So that kind of stuff, you know, sort of worked because uh, a lot, a majority of the uh, uh, Mizrahim, you know, the Jewish Arabs came to Israel in the 50s and uh, they were made into a uh, second caste, uh, lower working class uh, people who worked for the lesser wages than the Ashkenazim. And then the Russians came and same thing, you know, with them again, you know, except that they got themselves organized. There are all these histories uh, of relations, you know, that are very uh, problematic and should be brought out, like we're doing here now, and uh, and uh, discounted, uh, discounted in, in the sense that we do not accept this as um, a continuing. Uh, way of uh, establishing relations between the Jewish and Muslim peoples, but rather as uh, errors that are easily corrected and much more easily corrected than the relations that Jewish people have with uh, Western Christianity. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, my view, you know, like I'm, I'm aware of the uh, Muslim Jewish uh, problems, but I'm aware that uh, these problems can be overcome. Right. And, uh, you know, the advantage, you know, of Jewish people living together with Muslims and Palestinians in particular is that we don't have to uh, uh, assimilate. You know, we don't have to uh, pretend that we are Christian Europeans or Christian uh, North Americans, you know, and go around, you know, dressed like a good Christian with uh, uh, a hat outside, taking off your hat when you come inside, wearing a tie all the time and uh, changing your name. <laughs> 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 but that's what it's like, you know, for Jewish people who live in 
in North America and in England, you know, in European countries in France, yeah, you have to change your first name to being a, a French name, and then you can keep your Jewish, you know, family name, but, <laughs> and then you can't say that you're Jewish either, you know, uh, it's really pathetic, you know, uh, I think that uh, Jewish Muslim relations are, have much more potential than Jewish Christian relations in the West. So uh, that's why I appreciate, you know, and understand, you know, you being a, a Jewish Muslim, Muslim Jewish, Jewish Muslim. And so I congratulate you on that breakthrough. Thank you. Let's see. You've not, have you ever traveled to a um, Muslim country? No, I've never been to any other countries outside the United States since I went to Canada one time, a couple times actually. Uh, but I was I never been doing a Muslim country now. Well, it would be interesting, you know. When I go back yeah. to Palestine, you know, when we set up a um, international guest house for volunteers, then I, I invite you to come there, and then you can see for yourself what it's like to actually live together with the Muslims. You know. Yeah, I always wanted to do that actually. Yes, I, I would take you to visit the Samaritans uh, in Nablus as well. They live on top of the mountain now, and uh, they're Jewish. They're not, they're pre-Jewish, they're Israelites, actually, you know, before the, uh, oh, wow. yeah, and uh, they, you know, they don't, they're all, they're from Samaria, they're not from Judea, so they don't call themselves Jewish, they call themselves Samarians, and Samaritans, mm -hmm. you know, is in, in English, and they have their own synagogue there, and they pray like Muslims, you know, they, they kneel down, you know, on a carpet, and they don't sit down on a chair, that sort of thing, you know, so that would be very interesting, you know, to see as well. And they certainly have been successful in living together with the Muslims. You know, they wear their traditional dress, you know, the older men, that is. And they come, you know, walking around the market. And nobody pays any attention to them, you know. And uh, I, I got introduced, you know, to uh, one or two such men and invited to uh, go up there. And I visited, went through the museum, met the son of the rabbi, who was uh, the director of the museum uh, for the, at the second time, made videos of the museum and all the... Uh, uh, the uh, narrative that was initially uh, given by the, uh, the museum uh, worker who was taking care of the museum for the Samaritans. And who was she? Not, not Samaritan. She was Muslim, Muslim Palestinian, working for the Samaritans and hosting the exhibits there and knowing the entire history of the Samaritans. And they treated the Samaritans as Palestinians, which they were. They had Palestinian identity numbers and everything. Mm. So they're a beautiful example of how Jews can live together with Samaritans, with the Muslims. So I, I'll introduce you to them as well. You know, okay. Nablus is fans, fascinating, you know, as a political culture. And it's much more of a uh, working class city rather than a Ramallah, which is like a business city. And where people are, are more assimilated and all the men wear Western clothing, women too. In Nablus, no, it's much more traditional. But more politically radical as well, so more progressive, even while being more Islamic. Huh. How does one get into Jerusalem, the, I mean, uh, to Palestine these days? Because I've been, I was reading articles and I was saying you have to go through Israel or Jordan or whatever. Yes, in uh, Jerusalem, you would be uh, able to visit Al-Quds, the, uh, the mosques there because you're Muslim, you would be allowed in. And, uh, and then the other historical uh, uh, site that should be known about is Petra, which is 3,500 years before the common era. That means, you know, like 5,500 years ago, they were building cities. They had 6,000 people living there in the mountains. And they carved out homes out of the, the limestone Sandstone, I think it is. Yeah, sandstone. Yeah. And they made incredible, you know, architectural sculptures, you know. And this was copied by the Greeks and Romans thereafter, while they were claiming that they're the ones who invented that arch architecture in the first place, which is not the case at all. So, you know, it's another thing that I think that, that you would uh, find very fascinating and uh, uh, let you realize, you know, that the, that the, um, the Oriental culture is so rich sophisticated, uh, not what is described by the Christian ideology as being, you know, pagans and barbaric and, uh, and, and, 
and uh, slave traders and all this. Now, it's true there were slaves in the Orient, but before Islam, Islam abolished uh, slavery. Before that, you know, it was uh, rather brutal in the uh, yeah. pre-Islamic culture because there was like 12 million slaves taken from Africa and there's no trace of them at this point. Why? Because all the male slaves were castrated to keep them docile and to prevent them from propagating. And now there's very few, no, very few black uh, Palestinians. There are a few, and they are integrated as much as anybody else, which shows, you know, the Muslim culture is uh, is not a racist culture like the Christian culture, which tries to uh, uh, build up national chauvinism by establishing a church in each uh, that corresponds to each nation. Now that uh, Protestant uh, Reformation uh, caused a, a lot of, you know, created a lot of racism because any uh, minority nationality in those countries was not considered to be a real national, even though they had lived there for a thousand years, like Jewish people in Poland. Right. So in Muslim culture, uh, other nations are easily integrated into society and there's a, a amiability, you know, that uh, is all pervasive and is uh, much more civilized than what we have here in the West, even though the West is more technologically advanced. So I, I wanted to make that point as well. Yeah. How uh, do you have relations with Muslims in your area? Do you know uh, of other Muslims? Yeah, there's some, there's some Muslims in my town actually, but I I rarely have any interaction with them because they're working or whatever. I don't, I don't really yeah. want anyone. Else. I'm, a, I'm the only one Muslim in my family, so it's cost. Feel kind of lonely. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever go to a mosque? There's one across the street from me, but it's I think it's closed right now. It's uh of the COVID. It's uh -huh. a Shia Muslim Shia Muslim mosque. But I've been there. I used to go there when I was Shia. But I even as a Sunni, I I I would still go there and visit there and you know, try to keep good relations with the people, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, what uh, would you say is the difference between uh, Shia and Sunni Islam? Um, there's a little slight variations in the prayer. Like in Sunni, we do this. In Sunni Islam, we do this. And then Shia hold their, 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 their arms to the side. And then that's pretty much it. Who is it? That at the end of the prayer, too, there's also like a little, so they, do, they do something like, like they tap their, their, or kneel their knees or do something like that. But we soon we just do this. Aslamu come up to Allah. Aslamu to Allah. Like that. It's the Sunni way. Uh, who is it that holds their hands in front of them? Their open hands like that. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. I just know they do this. Oh. Uh huh. Okay. Um. Oh. Uh, so what? Uh, how did Sunni and Shia currents uh, ar arise? You know, what explains, you know, their differences and why they have remained their difference? Oh, that's very interesting, actually. It started at the end of the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He, when he passed away, so the Shia said that the Shia, the Shia companions that were, were preparing him for preparing for burial and like his, uh, the grandson, I think it was it, in-law, uh, Ali, he was, um, preparing the, bur the burial and the Sunnis were like um, they were like debating on who should become the new ruler of this of the of future of the Uma. that's where it all started the future like the, it started with like who should be the ruler, ruler of the Uma? should it be the family of the prophet or should it be the people that, that were closest to him yes uh -huh. yeah that corresponds to what I've uh, learned as well uh, the Sunni <laughs> sort of tradition is uh, much more uh, of a family descendants you know um, more of a uh, what I would call an aristocracy. And the Shiite tradition mm. uh, is more popular, more, let's say, democratic, in which uh, the rulers are the imams who emerge from the uh, political culture of society and are not necessarily, you know, related to the, uh, to the prophet uh, by uh, descendants. So there's a difference there. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. I think there's something similar in the, in the Judaic tradition as well, you know, because it is said that, uh, that the prophets only come from the line of David. 
there were there prophets before David, you know, so I don't see the logic of that, you know, but nonetheless, uh, mm, yeah. the line of David is considered to be some sort of a hereditary uh, uh, tradition, uh, which determines, you know, what authority you have in the Jewish political culture, or what tribe you belong to. Like what's what remains uh, of the tribal system in the Judaic culture is uh, there's the Kohanim, the priests, the Levi, the assistant priests, and then everybody else is, you know, an is, is Israel. Now, my father told me that I belong to the tribe of Israel. So according to Judaic tradition, <laughs> Israel is a tribe. It's not a country. It's not a land. So yeah, uh, yeah. So. Um, which uh, tradition do you consider to be um, more valid, uh, Sunni or Shia? I have a debate on that, actually. Um, I, I do believe that in certain, certain, certain circumstances that the Shia are correct. Actually, I had a friend who was actually um, believed that he was Sunni, but he, was, he believed the Shia were correct on like the Imami, they called it, for like the Caliphate. Uh -huh. So it was, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more towards Sunni right now because I try to, I do the Sunni ways. But I believe she are, are my Muslim brothers and sisters, and that we all should unite as one. Uh -huh. um, uh, what is there a difference between Sunni and Shia traditions with respect to the Caliphate? Is there a different way of um, organizing society according to each? Sunni, it's the elect, they, they elect uh, like through a Shura consul. That's how they. That's how they elect the next caliph, and the Shia. I'm not 100 percent sure. I haven't really looked into it per se. Besides that, the where his in the lineage of the prophet that they should uh, go for for that way. Uh huh. Uh huh. Interesting. There's um, uh, a difference between uh, the Muslim uh, uh, political culture and uh, the. Uh, pan-Arabism that was proposed by Nasser, but sometimes they merge, and uh, they merge around the idea of the caliphate, uh, which the caliphate would, you know, unite all of the uh, um, Muslim Arabs, at least, within the same uh, uh, superstructure. So there's, uh, there's something uh, to be explored in that uh, direction as well, but uh, I uh, very much appreciate Nasser's uh, concept of uh, pan-Arabism because as I pointed out, you know, to uh, one particular forum in Nablus that, uh, you know, it determines, you know, how you count the numbers, the numbers of, uh, of people, you know, of one nation or another. So in Palestine right now, you have about equal numbers of Palestinians and, uh, and Jewish Israelis. Okay. But if you talk about, uh, uh, Arabism, pan-Arabism, then the numbers change, you know, because half of the Jewish Israeli population are Jewish Arabs, Mizrahim, from North Africa. Okay, so if you add them to the number of, uh, of Palestinians who are Arabs, well, then all of a sudden, you know, it turns into uh, 10 million Arabs and 4 million or three million uh, non-Arabs or Ashkenazim and Russians. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the uh, Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians, were to recognize the Jewish Arabs as Arabs, offer them the means by which to live together with the other Arabs in Palestine who are Muslims, then the Jewish Arabs would no longer be, you know, brainwashed by the Zionist apparatus to believe that they can get a better deal, you know, under Zionism. If they got a better deal under the Muslim Palestinians, then they would become allies of the Muslim Palestinians. And that would be the end of the Zionist regime, of course, because the preponderance, you know, demographically. And even in the soldiers, you know, amongst the soldiers, you know, a lot of the Mizrahim, you know, uh, go into, you know, being soldiers because they don't, have the um, the fast track, you know, into universities and getting an exemption or whatever. So they're in the military as well. Now, if the Muslim Palestinians, you know, were to offer them, you know, a better deal, and offer them an alliance and offer them peace, then you know, like 
they wouldn't obey the orders you know, of the Ashkenazi officers. They wouldn't go killing Palestinians if they knew the Palestinians were more friendly to them than the, the officers that were ordering them around. So right. it would change. the whole political scene there would change. So I think that um, you know, these things um, you know, are very important to consider in, in terms of you know, strategy and in terms of program. And then we can break through the impasse that we are being presented with. And everybody, you know, is trying to convince us that there's no way out of this impasse and that um, Israel, uh, you know, has to continue on the way it is, you know, and uh, protect itself and its sovereignty by militaristic means. There's a political solution and we have it. And I think that uh, we are the ones, you know, who are su supposed to give voice, you know, to the solution and break through the Zionist impasse that is being imposed upon us. I think that... Uh, right. I, I am very optimistic, you know, when I'm speaking with you about these matters, because I think that we are the ones, you know, who can achieve this, uh, this goal, even though we are small in numbers at this time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, we should uh, try to make contact by means of this video with uh, the uh, Muslims and the uh, Arabic speakers. I, I wish to report that I tried to uh, put in um, Arabic subtitles in the previous, you know, video that we had done, and uh, with the YouTube uh, applications that are available, and it didn't work. <laughs> you know what turned up? You know when you call, when you click on captions, you know, for the previous video, is uh, Chinese. <laughs> Somehow it converted, you know, Arabic into Chinese. You know, I, that's the only uh, subtitles that I could get. You know that. Uh, were embedded into the video. So mm. we'll have to uh, test it out more and uh, learn how to uh, make an Arabic uh, uh, subtitles just so that uh, all the uh, Muslims can uh, appreciate, you know, what we have to say. And I'm sure we'll be able to get that done and we'll do so in the short time, in the short term. So I think that we've gone through a lot uh, today and uh, uh, we will now, uh, uh, upload our, our video and uh, circulate it, you know, for the attention of uh, all the Muslims in the world. That's about 2 billion people, I believe. Is that the number? Yeah, of about that. Yeah. yeah it's, like, it's about that, very much. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So now we've got a big job. So uh, thank you very much for uh, mostly listening to me, but, you know, uh, understanding and taking part, you know, in, uh, in our endeavor. And uh, we will continue to do so. Inshallah. Um, let's uh, put our mute on now and uh, let the video uh, go on for uh, the cards that will be uh, put onto the videos showing people where else they can get further information uh, on our work. And uh, that way uh, the video will include, you know, the, um, the information uh, that we will uh, uh, place uh, on the uh, video in the form of cards for the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund website and for uh, another uh, uh, Bundes channel that I wish to promote uh, from Steve Struggle, Pantherism it's called, and of course your uh, YouTube channel as well, which is under your own name, Eric Grodsky, G-R-O-D-S-K-Y. 